to be here and to share with you some solution to reduce the contamination of food because I think really uh, one solution to, to solve the issue of the contamination of food is to stop it and to stop immigration. And uh, since we are in the digital era, I will propose something, is a poll. During my talk, you will have the possibility to vote. Please go on this website with your phone. You have to enter this code. I, I wrote it on the board, on the whiteboard, and you can vote. I just ask two questions, and at the end of my talk, we will see the results. And uh, what I suggest is that if we are looking at the evolution of uh, the techniques and the method that we are using, at the end, we are all the time using a computer. Is the computer the solution? It can be the solution if it proposes something which is disruptive, some kind of disruptive innovation. That means if by using calculation, we can go faster, we can go stronger, and we can protect more the consumer. And uh, is it safe really to use a computer rather than doing experiments? That's really perhaps is a good question. Uh, something sure, when you are using a computer, you can get the result faster. Instead of waiting for 10 days, you can have the result in a few seconds or a few minutes. That means you can have a very fast result. Uh, I don't know why the presentation is advancing alone. It's really disturbing. Uh, something you have to know, that means uh, that's within the law in EU in the US currently. Uh, currently, we have very few requirements. In the past, we have some requirements such as the generally recognized deficient models. It's not, it's not the case anymore. That sh should be just scientific sound. There is no distinction between a virtual experiment reproducing a lab experiment or a real food. The only thing that we are asking is to get conservative assumptions. That means to be sure that we maximize the amount released in the food. Uh, there are still some known issues. I will, be, I will go back on these questions. That means insufficient guidance and training. There is no universal software. And that depends strongly on the advance that we reach in research. Now, if we are looking in the European law, more or less we say you have the right to contaminate the food. And we state, we, that means the law determines the maximum amount which could be acceptable in the food. Uh, in 2002, we introduced the possibility to use the models to check that contamination is not too large. And it was stated for certain plastics, we recognize, that means, I don't know, there is really an issue. Uh, it's advancing alone. That, that means in 2002, it was stated, you can use modeling if you use the generally recognized diffusion models. In 2011, we changed the law and is not mentioned anymore, we said that as migration testing is complex, costly, and time-consuming, it should be admissible that compliance can be demonstrated also by calculations, including modeling. And what is stated, including, model, including modeling, order and analysis, and scientific evidence are reasoning if these render results which are least as severe as the migration testing. That's all. You can use, it's open bar. You can use almost everything you want if you verify that. That looks really, really nice. Huh? Then the question is, is modeling a trusted science? If you look at the, just one single journal, the SR journal, and you look for the word modeling. Modeling, in this case, I took with 2L. And you have 500 papers related to food contact materials and ingredients, which are using modeling. That means it's really impressive. That means modeling is used for a lot of applications, not only in the EU, but also in the US, is something that I took from the CFR. That means, uh, in, the case, in this case, that was uh, a recycling process that was uh, submitted <coughs> by the fund offer. It was reviewed by FDA, and uh, they agree, based on the surrogate testing and migration modeling, we consider that the process is safe. That means that that's start to become common practice to use modeling. Uh, if we come back to early stage, during the year 80 and 90, people were fighting to, to determine whether migration was controlled or not by diffusion law. That's the case. It's quite well accepted. We fight it for decades to determine which kind of mathematical equation we could use to predict the diffusion coefficients. 
uh, is still advancing along. Uh, first paper in, in 94, uh, the PhD student uh, was uh, Banner, and uh, he proposed the first model. In the US, they proposed another model. Then uh, the EU funded a task force to, to reach a common agreement, and at the end, they reach an agreement, and uh, you have a paper of 2005 where the industry and public laboratories are involved, and the state migration modeling is safe for demonstrating the compliance of full contact materials. At the, at the time, it was considered as safe only for polyolefins, not for other materials. Then, 20 years later, uh, it's still advancing along, I want to express a point of view. You have everything which has been put in the law is put in reports. In particular, the last European report of 2015 is practical guideline on the application of migration modeling. That's one thing. On the other thing, you have uh, some research program that try to predict the properties in polymers. Modeling, for example, this is H2020, program materials project. You have a lot of phys physical laboratory, you have a chemical laboratory wo working on the prediction of properties. And you have two different points of view. Here, the science, we publish it in reports and in one single journal, more or less, food additives and contaminants. And here, we publish in polymer science a journal. The science are not the same. And it's funded by the EU in both cases. What you can do? That means uh, you can use crazy models, but just in worst case, please. That means uh, when the diffusion coefficients versus molecular mass are spread like that, what you can do in a crazy manner is to be sure that you overestimate everything. Here I put the different model that has been published in the literature. You can use, sorry, you can use any of these models. That's right. Uh, but if you want to do something more sophisticated, you have to do really more sophisticated modeling based on realistic properties or even probabilistic scenario. If you do that, if you do really strong science, you can extend modeling to many aspects, downwards to migration modeling, for sure food packaging, you can cover the supply chain, and population exposure. What I will show you is that we ha it has been spread in all directions now by using mainly strong science. Migration modeling is used for compliance, is we use for risk assessment, and I will show you some examples. Uh, what is migration modeling? That consists to predict the amount of substances transferred from the packaging to the food. Initially, the substances in the packaging are in a range. When they are transferred to the food, they become red, and I put them larger. In this case, we introduce a barrier to diffusion. That means what you see in this simulation, that's the same time scale, you will see that there is a delay in the contamination of the food itself. That means that we have a solution to decrease the contamination. Even if the substance is harmful, it's still advancing alone. That means even if the substance is harmful, we can have solution with a design to reduce the contamination. For example, by using multi-layer materials. The modeling, this kind of modeling is available, such as the modeling, the reverse modeling, to simulate the transfer from the food to the polymer. They can plasticize the polymer, they can swell it, they can create cracks, they can create aging. This is covered. In particular, you have to think about biodegradable polymers. I saw in the previous presentation something related to PLA. Something that works also, something we are doing with the Food and Drug Administration in Boston, is uh, to predict what we could eat after a nuclear accident, such as the one of Fukushima. That means, is it safe to drink water after a nuclear disaster? And in this case, you need to simulate the, the permeation of contaminant radionuclides that are outside. They are initially blue. They move inside the wall. They become orange. Then, after some amount of time, sorry, they migrate into the food and then become red. And you will see even a crossover. At the end, you accumulate more radionuclides in the food than in the packaging. Modeling can cover all of these situations and can cover many cases that could be applied, and it's applied in the literature for coatings, that means for printing inks, it's uh, for cardboard, 
and uh, we can apply also for bacides, for also for uh, adhesives with the isocyanates. That means for compliance, modeling is currently used in a really a broad range of applications. You know the thing for cross system, but we are working for the industry with uh, repeated use, pipe, tanks. We can cover all of these applications. It has been used also not only for compliance but for risk assessment, in particular to assess consumer exposure, and also for risk management. And it's something that I want to discuss with you with modeling. You can prevent the contamination of food. Because currently, the current approach, we say low contamination, low toxicity, but perhaps we can remove the contamination and to put as low as possible and in a cheaper manner. Because why to do tests, why to pay so much money on finished product. Why not to start directly at the design? Perhaps we could do better packaging from scratch. That could be perhaps better and easier. That's the goal of engineering. I will give you a, a small example. It's quite famous because I presented in many conferences where we want to address the contamination from a photo initiator coming from printing inks. That means you see clearly that we stack all the caps. And the question is, I ask all the time the same question, what is the most critical step if you want to reduce the contamination of, uh, from a UV, that means uh, from a photo initiator for uh, some kind of Chinese soup? You have hot filling, long time storage, and microwave eating. And you can imagine, if you model the contamination, we will say it's a long-term storage. Don't say it's microwave oven eating, that means the temperature is too low, you have too much water inside, and the contact time is too short. We could say that's this step. That cannot be this step, because we have a new food. That means we cannot contaminate the, the food. But it's not the way you have to evaluate the contribution of one step. The way to evaluate it is that if you want to evaluate the contribution of this step, you evaluate the concentration in the food at the end of the four steps that you compare with the same process when you remove this step. That you, put, you do the three steps without this one, and you compare whether the two concentrations are the same or not. If they are the same, that means that this step is not significant. If they are different, that means that this step was important. And if you do this, you will demonstrate, uh, I put here a Pareto, the most important step is this one, is the stacking. Because you redistribute the contaminant, you put in contact the inner layer of the cap with the external printed layer. That means you create a shortcut. And uh, that's obvious in this case. We generalize that. With this, we can compare design, we can uh, compare substances, we got dimensional less numbers. That means that we can optimize the design, the formulation of packaging to reduce contamination and to reduce also the risk. Something also which is quite useful with modeling, that means we can assess the release potential from scratch directly from the molecular structures. And I will give you some examples. For example, for recycling materials. The problem with the recycling materials, that means you don't know well the contaminants. They are mainly post-consumer Consum contamination, that means non-intentionally added substances. We know little, we don't have the, the, egg, the pure substance. I have a small issue with this set. Migration, that means if we introduce chemical structure, we need to use a molecular modeling. We have several techniques. I don't enter into the details, but something you have to know, we can use a brute force modeling, at least we can represent all atoms in the packaging and in the migrants. Uh, that can work, just to give you, uh, we should have a video that should move in all directions. Ah, I'm waiting a little, that's how to move. You have here diffusion of gases, diffusion of uh, a small substance methoxybenzene, you have air oligophenols. We can study the diffusion really using brute force in polyolefins quite easily with, with little effort, just using quite big computers. Currently, we are in this, currently we are in 2018. In 2018, we can model 
crankshaft motion in, poly in polymers and also reptation. Not fully the reptation of polymer, but we can predict the diffusion coefficient as low as 10 minus 14 square meter per second, just in a few days, just by sketching molecules, that's all. That means we can do it for diffusion, that works really well. And one thing we demonstrated quite recently is that if you add one carbon here between two aromatic rings, you can decrease the diffusion coefficient by eight each time you add just one single carbon. That means if you add two carbons, you divide by 64 the diffusion coefficient. That means that we can even create a molecule that diffuses less. That means that it will induce less migration. Uh, with uh, previous procedure, you need uh, to get the same reduction. You need uh, to double the size of the substance. For example, if you go to biphenyl to quaterphenyl, you just divide by 64 the diffusion coefficient, but you can do the same just by adding two carbons, by adding flexible elements close to the center of mass of the solute. We can do also molecular modeling uh, to assess uh, chemical affinity. You have here the packaging, the food, the packaging and the food for different chemical affinities. Here, the substance prefer to stay in the material. Here, the substance prefer the food. And you see clearly that with the same time scale, you, have, you, you almost empty the materials with time. You have almost a complete extraction in this case, and here, limited extraction. And uh, the key is to be able to predict this chemical affinity. Uh, I don't want to come back too much on that, but I think uh, all of you know really well uh, the ma major crisis of isopropyl thioxanthone that was in 2005. It's something which is really well documented. It was a contamination from printing inks due to the set of problem. We put in contact the inner, the inner liner with the external part of the film. But something which is not really well known is that initially, that means the tests that were carried out by, uh, in this case, that was not, uh, that was the packaging industry. That wa they were doing tests with water. And we were able to demonstrate in modeling that the levels that has been observed by enforcement laboratories could have been predicted only by using modeling. Uh, this is a publication of 2009. And uh, something we also discuss is that there, is, there are some loops and some gaps in our regulation. Before 2002, to test milk, the industry was using distilled water. That was crazy. That means if you use the distilled water, you have a migration. You, you assess a migration here when the real migration is here. That's a problem. Currently, in 2007, it has been decided to replace the milk with 3% of fat content with ethanol 50%. In this case, the partition coefficient between the food and polyethylene, in this case, they are here. You can see the shape. And this is what is missing as a safety. That means the modeling is clear. We still suffer a lack of safety. Read the paper, please. Huh? It's well explained. And uh, I don't see any correlation between milk, which is an emulsion of fat in water, 3% of fat, and uh, water ethanol mixture. Please, uh, you will have to explain to me. That means modeling can also help to take the right decision. Uh, in fact, it's not really modeling, it's physical chemistry. This kind of approach uh, to predict uh, partition coefficient has been well expanded. Currently, you can choose uh, the solute in the list, the kind of simulant. You can choose the crystallinity, the type of plasticizer, and you can predict a lot of properties. And uh, something I want to show you, we created a small application in collaboration with uh, ChemSpider. That means uh, f using uh, ChemSpider tools, we can predict uh, the partition coefficient between air and many substances. Uh, that means uh, between air and polymers, and you can determine whether this kind of substance can migrate or not without contact. And my point is what creates contamination is mainly ignorance. Ignorance is the main source of contamination. And you have a definition of ignorance. It divided by what you know about it. 
And uh, what you have to imagine is that the industry, even when they are producing just one single bottle, they have the body, the cap, the label, and they have to combine all of that. How do you would like that they manage this kind of complexity? Do, do I have an endocrine disruptor in the plastic film, in, in some of the additives, in some process aid, processing aids? It's really complex. Since at any food plant, they don't manage one single packaging, they manage several packaging at the same time. They have hundred thousands references to manage at the same time. And the thousands of substances. It's really difficult. What we propose in our scheme is multi-scale modeling that can help to predict foreseen and unforeseen consequences of poor design, poor formulation, quite easily. Just to give you an idea, it's something that we are doing in the lab. We are working on the migration of printing inks, coming directly from cardboard in contact, coming from, uh, that means secondary packaging. Yes, and we can do modeling at very different scales with two targets, either to understand, uh, that means the buyer effects, how to create a good buyer to mineral oil, and also to innovate on fibrous materials. And you, you have here some point of view that I want to share with you. You have here, we can use modeling as something agencies are doing quite a lot for assessment. They start with the molecules, then they try to predict chronic exposure. But you can do also the reverse. It's what we call reverse engineering. You can try to design safe additives, safe molecules, safe design also. That's something that means uh, that I propose. Uh, I don't have the time to, uh, to present it fully, but uh, you have here a decision tree. You want to, des to design a new food contact materials. What are the right decisions to, to take before going on the market? And if you're interested in more modeling, when I was a visiting professor at the School of Packaging at the Michigan State University, I made several lectures. They are available online. And I encourage you to look at the presentation of Eric Batelemy, my colleague at EFSA. It's really funny. It is really a good one. And uh, I don't know whether you vote or whether it's not working or not. We should have, I'm looking. Did you vote? But you have to discuss with me. I will use my own computer. I don't know why it's not working there. But thank you a lot for your attention.